Oh, why, hi there, I'm Ron Zuckett, Uncle Ron, and I've already had too much coffee this Saturday afternoon. So, let's take a look at, I don't know what the heck that was, uh, where we are in our 1978 baseball replay. Generally, 18 to 20 games to go, so about three weeks when we restart uh, this coming week. We'll do four games for you, and then take Friday off, I think. And then go through Saturday and Sunday, and then we'll, so it's six games next week, and then we're going to go through and do seven at a minimum, because it's coming there. So we're going to go through some standings, go through some league leaders, and just kind of give my observations on a few things, and then show you some individual team statistics. All right? All right, let's do that. And so let's start with the standings. Let me hit this button right here because you can see everything. Okay, so let's start with the National League because that's already up on the screen. The Dodgers have a five-and-a-half game lead. They have played 145 games. They have 17 left, and their magic number is 13. They have six left against Cincinnati and six left against San Diego. The Reds have struggled. I mean, the Dodgers have kind of fumbled down the stretch a bit too, but the Reds really just aren't, look at their road record. They're 31 and 39. The Dodgers, on the other hand, only have six road games left. They are 40 and 35, 75, 82, seven games left. At home, they've played 70, so they have 11 games left at home. I like the Dodgers' chances. They're 45 and 28 in the division, and I'll even go this far. I not only think they win the division, I'll tell you who I'm going to use for starters and the first three games of the LCS. Uh, they would be on the road. So you would see Burt Hooten, because I took to see how the Dodgers use their rotation down the stretch. It's Burt Hooten in game one, Bob Welch in game two, and Don Sutton at home in Los Angeles in game three. Uh, using Hooten in one, and I'll show you why we would use Hooten in a few minutes, uh, he would have the option to pitch game four if the Dodgers are down to an elimination game or game five if it is a true game five. Uh, well, if the Dodgers can put a team away in game four, I would use either Doug Rao, Rick Roden, or Tommy John. But my guess is I'd probably use Roden. I haven't looked really at the Reds. I, they're just, they're not that good. They're not that good. They're good pitching-wise, but their bullpen's terrible. And if they somehow made the playoffs... I don't think they win. Plus, they're 21 and 26 in one-run games. It doesn't. Things do not favor the Reds. The Padres at 76 and 70. I don't think the Dodgers are going to give them the chance to make up seven and a half with that few games left to go. The Dodgers would have to collapse. Padres, by the way, are 14 and three in extra innings. In the East, the reason why I'm doing this video, Philadelphia has caught fire again. But there's a huge caveat there. Pirates ERA in real life was 348. Their ERA in the replay, as I'll show you, is just over three. The last four games of the year between for the Pittsburgh Pirates are at home against Philadelphia. So they're 81 and 63. They played 144 games. So they essentially have um, 14 games to get two games back in the standings. That's doable. Phillies are incredible at home, 15 and 23. They're a 500 team on the road. Pirates are not good in the division, and they're 6 and 10 in extra innings, and terrible in one run games. I still think with a run differential of 115, that Pittsburgh probably is the better team. But you saw them the last two games. If not, go back and watch. You watch Kent Colby and Grant Jackson blow leads two nights in a row, and oh, oh. <laughs> Look at the runs allowed by both Philly and Pittsburgh. You'd have to think that whoever survives the East is going to be favored. I just don't like the Dodgers starting pitching. Um, I like their bullpen just fine. I don't like their starters. And as you can see, Chicago, St. Louis, New York, and Atlanta are already hoping for 1979. And it won't really help other than 1979. <laughs> All right, American League. Texas by four and a half over Kansas City and six and a half over Minnesota. 
Now, although Kansas City has a run differential and a good road record, they're terrible on the road and under 500 one-run games and extra inning games. I'll tell you right now, Texas has nine games left against C Seattle. Kansas City still has to play Seattle a few times too. But nine games for Texas versus the Mariners. And in fact, except for, I think, one more game against, a couple games against Minnesota, Texas is playing bottom feeders in the American League West. This is Texas's division to lose. And I haven't seen how they would st stack up for a playoff run yet, but I like the Rangers starting rotation. You would get Matlack, or John Matlack and Fergie Jenkins going maybe twice, depending on how we go with that. And we can kind of cobble together a, a third starter. Now, in the East, the Orioles and the Yankees have the toughest division roads to hold. They both have big games to go. Milwaukee found the wrong time to fall apart. Their starting pitching has collapsed, and their bullpen isn't that good. I'm talking about the Brewers. They are Milwaukee 22 and 25 on one run games. The Yankees are not a good team. At Yankee Stadium, they have 12 or 11 games left on at home, and three and and eight games left on the road. So they can kind of flip flop things. The one benefit the Yankees have, if they do make the playoffs and don't need to play a game 163 against Baltimore or Milwaukee, is that they'd be able to go with Ron Guidry in Game One, and probably Ed Figueroa in Game Two. And those games would be at the home of the American League West. So those games would probably be in Arlington. And we'd have the rare case, we'll check to see when the last time that John Matlack pitches in the regular season, that you might see a game one of the playoffs be the exact same starters as game one of the regular season. Ron Guidry and John Matlack in, in Arlington, in Texas. Uh, we'll look at Boston. I don't know why this team is under 500 or 500 team. They are much better than that, except for the computer and Don Zimmer aren't on speaking terms. Toronto has been eliminated. Cleveland's tragic number is two. Boston's is seven, although they're not going to make it. Um, Minnesota and Kansas City play too many times. It'll either be Kansas City or Minnesota that's challenging Texas. Texas is rooting for Minnesota because the more they beat Kansas City, the more that magic number can come down. And the Royals' problem is on the road. They're 32 and 43. They're 45 and 23 at home, but they are already will have an under 500 record on the road. And they're under 500 in one run games at 22 and 24. The West isn't very good. Before we get into individual teams, let's take a look at leaders in both the leagues. First, the National League. Dave Parker is cruising towards a triple crown. He leads Jose Cruz by almost 32 points in batting average. He leads George Hendrick and George Foster by six home runs. And George Hendrick by eight RBI. Plus, that OPS of 1106 will do that. Dave Parker is your presumptive National League MVP. And looks like he's cruising towards a triple crown which I haven't didn't pick up on the broadcast. Gene Richards is one of the reasons why San Diego is still in the race. He's hitting 329, 16 triples, my goodness, and four, 35 stolen bases. He's got an OPS of 845. Um, George Hendrick is second in the National League in OPS at 975, hitting 327, 29 homers and 104 RBI, a major year, but the Cardinals... Or 1686, and we don't talk about them. Uh, let's see. Pitching leaders, Greg Swan looks like he's going to win the MV, uh, not the MVP, but the ERA title. He's certainly eligible for it. He's got a whip of 1009 and an opponent batting average of 204 and is 15 and 9. Won the lone bright spots along with Lindsey Nelson's jackets for the New York Mets. Dick Rudvin, 13 and 10, with both Atlanta and Philadelphia, has a whip under 1. And an ERA at 226. Tom Seaver, the lone bright spot for the Reds in the rotation, 16 and 5 with a 235 ERA. And you notice who you don't see in any of those ERA leaders? Any of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Burt Hooten 
is the only Dodger starter with an ERA under three. He's won 18 games. Uh, Doug Bear, by the way, 33 saves for the Reds. He is a lone bright spot in the bullpen that, um, well, let's just say finger paints on a regular basis. Raleigh Fingers, another reason why San Diego is doing so well, 30 saves. And Kent DeColvey, although he hasn't pitched well the last couple games, has kind of propped up Pittsburgh. J.R. Richard will strike out 300. Phil Necro, kind of looking for his Cy Young himself. He's 22-10, and 10, an ERA of under 2.5. Leads the league in wins in a second by a mile in strike, well, under a mile by strikeouts for J.R. Richard. American League. We got a four-batter race here for the batting title. Rod Carew, his last year in Minneapolis, or Bloomington, hitting 333. Ralph Gar qualifies for the moment for batting for batting title, hitting 331. John Grubb, who's with the Rangers, must have been a late-season acquisition, uh, hitting 323 with 17 homers and 67 RBI. And Jim Rice, who, in all intents and purposes, is in a triple crown race. He's hitting 319. He's hit 51 homers. That's a 10 home run lead over Larry Heisel. And driven in 149, a 39 spot over Staub. Although on Andy Thornton of the Indians leads in OPS with 1022 to Rice's 1018. Craig Dentals has had an amazing year as well, hitting 319, 30 homers. And 100 RBI. He really is the straw that stirs the Yankees' drink. Lyman Bostock is ninth in the league at 309. And Mario Guerrero, there, there is one you don't really expect to see, uh, hitting 307. Uh, Gary Sarum got lit up his last start. So John Matlack now has the ERA lead. Sarum does have enough innings. And 210 is a fine year. Again, Minnesota may be the biggest pleasant surprise in baseball. Ron Guidry at 19 and 6 with a 216 ERA. His strikeout total, Guidry's a 240, probably would be enough to tilt the Cy Young to Guidry's way. Remember, the Yankees do not want to play a game 163. If they don't, then Guidry would lose a start. But he's had a fine, fine year. Mike Caldwell, 60 to 10. And Larry Sorensen, let me show you his numbers. He, no, it's not what I meant to do. He was, uh, at the end of July, 18 and uh, 4. And since the 1st of August, he is 4 and 4. Though he's pitched better in September. He is 4. Three games to go, and his whip is still fantastic, but I'm thinking that probably his Cy Young hopes are going by the wayside. I think Gidry has had a better year. Goose Gossage out of the pen, although the Yankees' computer hasn't used him very much, is 25 saves. Dave LaRoche is 20. Reggie Cleveland for Texas has 17, and if they can get six or seven innings out of their starters if they make the playoffs, it's a winnable series for the Rangers. I don't think this is any dead things yet. So that's a look at the leaders. My guess is that Rice will win the MVP, and it will come down to Matlack or Guidry for the Saw Young, although Gary Serum has had a heck of a year, an absolute heck of a year. Next, we're going to take a look at some teams. We're going to start with the Red Sox because they're the ones that seem to be the biggest enigma of the year. Jim Rice, as I said, is having just an absolutely monster year. He also has 382 total bases. The team is hitting 266, but the ERA is terrible. It's 410. But when I was looking, talking with Kurt Berglund this morning on Facebook about why the Red Sox are such an enigma, we thought it was because... They're just using their starters too much. And if you look at the complete game number down at the bottom, they've already thrown 64. In real life, they threw 54. So they've already used the rotation too much. But you can't blame Dennis Eckersley for this. Eckersley has had a monster year. He still has five starts left. And his numbers, although the win-loss looks terrible at 13 and 14 compared to 20 and 8, 
His whip is at 1103. His opponent batting average is 20 points better than real life, and his ERA is at 285. So why has he struggled? Well, the Red Sox haven't given him a lot of run support. Only 3.58. That's not going to get it done. He has pitched, look at, since July, an ERA of 160 in July, 256, or June rather, 256 in July, and 225 the last two months. He has done everything he is supposed to do except for get wins. It really is amazing. And the Red Sox have stolen 75 bases. It's not like they haven't tried to run. But here's the problem with the Red Sox. Bob Stanley is supposed to throw 100 and... Well, I'll post it. Bob Stanley is supposed to throw 52 times and throw 141 and two-thirds innings. He's gone 21 times and thrown 41 innings. There's 100 innings that Stanley isn't going to get. He's going to get two more starts down the stretch, and it really won't matter because the Red Sox are out of it. But they did not use him out of the pen, and even though you look at his numbers, the replay compared to real life, it's just not great. But still, you got to use him. The computer didn't use him. In fact, in June and July, when it would have made a difference, he went eight or nine and a third innings in two months. That's just... To me, that's the AI. Tom Bergmeier has been used a lot, and Bill Campbell, too. Campbell's ERA is close to, is over six. The other big arm out of the bullpen, Dick Drago, has only gone 30 innings and has an ERA of close to six. So the Red Sox bullpen hasn't done too much offense. Look, I mean, they've scored, where is it, 717 runs in 144 games. And only allowed 645. This is not a 500 team. But sometimes things happen and they aren't going to make it. No, I don't want to see Bob Bailey. How good is Jim Rice? How good is Jim Rice? He's already exceeded his home run total. He's already exceeded his real-life RBI total. But look at his average is pretty much the same. His OB um, base percentage is right there. He's slugged a great deal. His OPS plus is 156. His on-base OB plus is 108. And he's just done everything, everything. In fact, in 50 at-bats in September, he's already slugged six home runs. What a year for Jim Ed. All right, let's go through the contenders and, and show you where they are. Let's start with the Dodgers. Lasorda's team has played very well, and they are now home for a lot of games. Houston, two against Houston, three against Atlanta, three against Cincinnati, <coughs> excuse me, and three against San Diego, and that will close out their home schedule. They Then they close out against Cincinnati and against San Diego, but I do think with all those games coming up at home, that they should have things wrapped up by the time they hit that final road trip. And who are they going to go pitch against? Seaver, yeah, okay, that's probably going to be a toughie. But Mario Soto, Mike Lacoste, not, no, they, they should beat those. The Mosquito against San Diego, Murrah and Perry on the last day of the season. I'm not going to change Sutton's start uh, for that. But those, they should go 4-2 and two on that last road trip. Steve Garvey has had a magnificent year, hitting 313, 268 bases and such. And just consistency up and down the lineup. Problem I see with the Dodgers is going to be their pitching rotation in the playoffs. Sutton, although his whip has been meh, his ERA is at 406 and he's 15 and 13. Bert Hooten, as far as I'm concerned, has earned a game one start. Right now he's 18 and 7 with an ERA at 278. And it's thrown 239 and two-thirds innings. That, that's who you go with. I'm going to skip John Rao and or, or Roden because I'm just not sure you, what you could get out of there. Although probably TJ would be who I would go with. And Roden would be the long man out of the pen. Because I'm going to go to Bob Welch, who is 7-4 and four 
with a whip under one. In fact, Hooten's whip is under one as well. So if you go with whip, sometimes it's always hard to, to go with. My three would be Hooten, Whip, and Sutton. I mean, Hooten, Welch, and Sutton with technically, I suppose, Roden could go in game four. But it'll all depend. The Dodgers' bullpen is better, but I still like I still like the Dodgers' chances, but it all comes down to their starting pitching. They're just Sutton should not be a 500 pitcher. What was he in real life? He was 15 and 11 in real life, so he really he is not pitched as well as he should. Uh, he's got three more starts. He's 33. We'll see. We'll absolutely see. The computer has left him in there a little too long. But, like I said, he's going to be a Game 3 starter. I'm on. No, I didn't hit that. Never mind. Now, Pittsburgh. After those two tough games in Philadelphia, they have five at home coming up, St. Louis and Montreal. Then they go to Chicago and Montreal. And then they're home the rest of the way. Chicago for three. And then look at here. Four against Philadelphia, if it matters. If it matters, on October 1st, we will change from uh, Odell Jones would not make his major league debut trying to clinch a pennant. Who would I use? I could go with, I would probably go with Candelaria against Jim Cott if it came down to that. Now, if it doesn't matter, we go with Odell Jones. The Pirates, I looked it up today, had an ERA, team ERA of 348 in real life. That's 309 after that. They have pitched exceedingly well and they can hit and Dave Parker is having a triple crown year he is MVP he is he is like a visa card he's everywhere you want to be Pirates rotation isn't terrible Burt Blylevin I think would go game one of the playoffs right and Don Robinson probably would go game two who would I go in game three maybe Jim Bibby or John Candelaria. So Bly Levin will get the start in game one. They've used a lot of their bullpen. They've only had 26 complete games all year. And so uh, if the Pirates can get in, I like their chances. They have no, outside of Bly Levin, you know, Robinson and Candelaria, kind of a joint number two. Uh, don't don't let the Pirates fool you. You know, don't let, don't let the, what happened this week fool you. They can win, and their bullpen... Well, you know it can be stronger, but they have Jackson and Grant Jackson and Kent Colby, and they can get there. I, I like their chances, uh, especially since they beat the Dodgers in all 12 games. But you know what happens when you try to repeat even replay history. Ask the 88 Dodgers about how they fared against the New York Mets. The Pirates have stolen, by the way, 203 bases. Okay, with a five-game lead, you've got the ideal schedule. You've got the Cubs at home, the Mets at home. Then you go to Montreal and play the Mets and for three. So you get six games left against the New York Mets. Then you have four against Montreal and four against Pittsburgh. I like the Phillies' chances. Now... Who would I use for a game one starter? I would go with Larry Christensen, and he will be fully rested if the Phillies win the division. His last start of the regular season is September 27th. And depending on, and I could go with Steve Carlton in game two. And I probably would go with Jim Cott in game, or Dick Ruthven. Actually, you know what? When's Ruthven's last start? The 29th? So, yeah, so you might not see Carlton until Game 3, potentially in Los Angeles, because you've got Dick Ruthman, who has pitched lights out. He's got an ERA of, or a whip of 896 and an ERA of 224. 
So Ruthven would be one of the arms I would go with. And maybe you would go with Ruthven. No, Ruth Christensen's going to be the fresher arm. So Ruthven and Christensen, in some order, if they do get the Dodgers, with Carlton and Sutton going in Game 3. Now, if I had to go with a Game 4 starter, uh, I might go with Cott. Because Whip and ERA are okay. And then, I don't know. We'll have to take a look because... Ruthven's numbers are incredible. 100 hits in 128 in the third innings, and a whip is at under one. If I had to go with somebody in a one-gamer in game five, my guess would be Ruthven with Christensen right behind. Of course, all hands on deck. As far as the offense is concerned, they're hitting 252. Schmidt having a, not a good year. Luzinski having what would normally be considered a decent MVP campaign if it wasn't for what Dave Parker's doing. But outside of that, it's pretty much a group effort. No huge superstars. In fact, nobody is over 250 total bases. Uh, so they can run. They've stolen 152 bases, and they've been 117 home runs. Pittsburgh is going to need Philadelphia to stumble because Philly's schedule is pretty much... On the easy side, you could almost go to Staples and get that button. So the Texas Rangers have kind of found themselves in a fairy tale. They also have nine games left against Seattle and four against Oakland at home. So, yeah, so two against California, four against Oakland, and five left against Seattle. Good luck, Kansas City. And how they've done it, they've just been really, really, really consistent. They closed the season with four against Seattle. And you could go with, yeah, John Matlack is going to have enough rest, I think, to go in a potential game one. So how have they done it? Again, no obvious superstars, just consistent. Al Oliver hitting 312. Mike Hargrove hitting 281. Richie Zisk and Bobby Bonds, 20 home run seasons. Bobby stolen 32 bases. Oh, yeah, the Rangers have stolen 182. They fly on the base pass. Bump Wills, he's only hitting 238, but he's got 45 stolen bases and an on base percentage of 333. They just. It's kind of like a nickel and a lunch pail team, I suppose. There's really no one there that goes, wow, you have to watch X to see, you know, the Rangers to watch X. Nope, they're just going to nickel and dime you to death, and they just do everything well. And as far as the pitching rotation is concerned, you got Matt Lack, who should be a 20-game winner, and Ferguson Jenkins, who's going to get a couple down the stretch. And I like Ferguson Jenkins' chance against Ed Figueroa in, in a potential game two in Arlington. Or pretty much when we show you the Orioles starters, they're all pretty much interchangeable. Doyle Alexander would make a great game three starter, although Doc Ellis has a better whip and ERA. And so you could conceivably see Matt Lock Jenkins and Ellis go in games one, two, and three. And then you've got Doyle Alexander in a game four, and then you could go with Matt Lack in a game five. Umbarger and Comer are, well, Comer's good out of the pen. And Reggie Cleveland has a 1.47 ERA and a whip under one. So if you can get it there, Cleveland's your guy. So I like the Rangers' chances. They have a lot of games left at home, and it's two against Minnesota and four against Seattle on the road to close the season. So there you go. I, uh, it's not a strong division, and Texas has done what they're supposed to do. And remember, it's not Pat Corrales as the manager. It's Billy Hunter. Kansas City schedule is a little bit tougher. There's a couple games left against California and Milwaukee, who, although Milwaukee won't win the division this year, they're still a tough out. They've got two in Seattle, four at Minnesota, and then the three against Seattle and three against Minnesota to close out the season. Problem is, I'm not sure how they get four and a half games better 
than Texas with that schedule because Kansas City has five games with Seattle. Texas has nine. If they make the playoffs, you can use Leonard and Splitorf in games one or and two. The or the Royals have hit well. They're not going to hit home runs. They haven't stolen as many bases as you'd think. But Hal McRae as a DH, 266, 242 total bases. Daryl Porter, 17 home runs, 233 total bases. Amos Otis hitting 300. And George Brett even having a bad year. Still has 19 stolen bases and 207 total bases and 11 triples. It's been an okay off. It's been a decent offense when you're getting 272. Pitching has been where they have struggled. Leonard and Splitorf combined are 32 and 27 with ERAs over 370. There's no ace. And that's, I think, what hurt Kansas City in this replay. They got a bunch of number twos, but there's no number one. And if they do draw the Yankees, I, I think they are in deep trouble. Or Baltimore, because Baltimore has, as we'll show you in a minute, a bunch of ones and twos. As far as uh, closers are concerned, Herboski, 41 appearances, 15 saves, an ERA of 131. Again, you can ride him for some six-out appearances and that. And Minori has been okay out of the pen. They just, it's just mediocre pitching in a division that's not great isn't going to get it done. And that's why I think the Rangers win this division. Outside of a couple of games against Milwaukee, Baltimore closes their season pretty much against Cleveland and Detroit. That's pretty easy. In fact, the Yankees get Cleveland at home to finish the season. So from September 18th on, Baltimore doesn't play a game against a team that's contending. Now, who would they go with in the playoffs? Well, you could go with Flanagan and Palmer, I think. Palmer actually had, will go the last time on the 28th. So I would use Palmer as a game one. He's 17-9 and nine right now with an ERA of 241 and a whip of just over one. Flanagan would be rested for game two. Although McGregor, does he is he hurt? McGregor hasn't wouldn't have started a game since September. No, it's September 24th. So I mean, they got four starters. So Palmer, McGregor, and Flanagan and Martinez. You're not going to go with a three-man rotation. Then you could go with Palmer necessary in a game five. So Baltimore's stick is going to be how far those four arms can get them. They are all. Ones or twos. There's not really a weak one in the bunch, and Earl Weaver knows it because the next one on the list, as far as number of starts is concerned, is Nellie Bryles in the 668 ERA. The big key to the Orioles is going to be their bullpen. Because, well, Stanhouse is enough to give you, you know, the runs 51 and two thirds innings, 51 hits. 9 and 5 with 11 saves. That's who you got to go with. But look at that whip of 1, 5, 4, 8. For a fireman, that's not good. Tibby Martinez is even worse. He's had a terrible regular season. 34 games, about 50 innings, 1, a 3 and 2 with a whip of 2054 and an ERA of 761. It really will depend on Baltimore. For Baltimore, how well their starters pitch. Eddie Murray, Rookie of the Year, 24 homers, 288, 96 RBI. Kenny Singleton has done extremely well. They've got 420 home run hitters. They've hit 146 on the year. They have a moderate amount of speed. They just get it done. They just get the job done. They're not a great offensive team. But a 3.65 ERA in the DH League will do it. And, and I think just looking at that, I mean, they have five games against Cleveland and seven against Detroit. That should be enough. The next five games for the Yankees are really, really huge because they have Boston at home, who was, as we talked about, better 
than their 72 and 72 record. And they have two more against Milwaukee. We said the Yankees don't play well at home. So depending on where they are, then they kind of hit, they do hit the easy part of their schedule. It's six on the road, three against Toronto, three against Cleveland. And then it's three against Toronto and three against Cleveland at the stadium. Forget the game against Boston because that game will not happen. The Yankees are hitting well, 273. And again, they're deep. This is an incredibly good offensive team. Nettles, if it wasn't for the fact that Rice was tearing up the American League, he's having an MVP year, 319, 30 homers, 100 RBI. Reggie Jackson only played 124 games. He and Billy Martin did not get along, and since it's an all-as-played replay, he probably didn't get the at-bats he should have. But he is hitting around 300 with 24 homers and 84 RBI. Then they got Chambliss and Munson and Rivers. It's a team full of contact hitters. Jackson is the only one that's going to strike out more than 100 times. They've scored 664 runs. They are going to lose Willie Randolph. And to lose that speed, he has 32 stolen bases and a 291 batting average and a 406 on base percentage. That is huge. Now, the problem that the Yankees are going to have going in the playoffs is who do you use after Guidry and Figueroa? Figueroa and will either start game one of an ALCS if there is no game 163 and if the Yankees make it, or Ron Guidry would start game one of an LCS because Guidry would start any prospective playoff game. Between them, they're 32 and 18, but Figueroa's whip is 1320 and his ERA is 376. And who do you throw behind them in the third game? Dick Tidro, who's under 500, has a whip right around 1.3 and an ERA of 4.22. The rookie Jim Beatty, who for a rookie has done, you know, no, not really, he will work out the pen. Or Catfish Hunter, who was 8 and 4 with a 401 ERA. I mean, I, it really depends on what game Guidry starts in the playoffs. If it's game one, he could certainly go game five. If it's game three, which is where he really pitched against the Kansas City Royals, then that's his one start. And so the Yankees would have to figure it out from Figueroa, Tidro, and Hunter how to get to Guidry or whatever, how, how you go from there. So the Yankees, are, although they're 83 and 60, they're in good shape. They're a half game out of first place. <sighs> Pitching is not their thing, and losing Willie Randolph is not going to help them either. It's a winnable division for them. If they can get past Boston and Milwaukee, the Torontos and Clevelands shouldn't scare them. On the other hand, it's the Clevelands and Detroit's that Baltimore play. Both teams kind of have it easy. I still kind of give advantage to the Orioles because of starting pitching, but the Yankees' offense plays very well. Oh, that took longer than I thought it was going to do. So there you go. You've seen stats and stories and standings, and when we're done with the season, we'll show you how it stacked up against real life. But we invite you to join us daily on twitch.tv slash retrosportsnetwork. Generally, to mon this coming week, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at noon Eastern, and Wednesday at 7 Eastern for the replay as we go over Pennant Chase 78. We're going to get this in. Three weeks left to go in the season, and really anything can happen. we got some good stories, and if you watch us on YouTube when we post stuff up, uh, there's been some incredible games. And so the last three weeks of the season coming at you, None of the divisions have been decided yet for certain, although I think the National League is starting to crystallize. But you never know. You never know. Hey, hit that like and subscribe. I'm Ron Juckett. We'll talk to you next time right here on Retro Sports Network.